Well, I think you have uh, witnessed something really uh, striking, I think. It's, uh, this is uh, the illustration of progress uh, in this field of uh, neuroprosthetics. Uh, it's really a, a paradigm shift in uh, um, approaching uh, the therapies for neurological disorders. Uh, the previous session we had heard how drug development is intense, uh, at least for some um, companies, to uh, um, provide uh, new molecules uh, for uh, treating brain disorders. Of course, this has been the traditional way of uh, approaching the therapy of brain uh, disorders, and, and we need more of this, certainly. But this uh, convergence of uh, uh, nanotechnologies, computer sciences, um, mathematics, physics, I mean, a lot of uh, um, approaches that have been, are being used to modulate uh, brain function with uh, exogenous uh, intervention is really something that uh, is, is emerging and, and has emerged over the last decade, I should say. And uh, in fact, this shows, I mean, uh, Grégoire was uh, stressing, uh, and all of uh, our speakers were stressing the importance of this collaboration uh, between um, different uh, um, approaches and, and competences. And uh, this is really the way, f one of the way forwards for treating uh, brain disorders. And of course, environments like EPFL and other technology universities where uh, biology and this technology are on the same campus provide an ideal environment uh, for this. Now, uh, what we have seen uh, is an uh, illustration of this. And for example, Ed, uh, one of the approaches that Ed uh, presented was the idea that you can actually activate specific neuronal populations uh, using uh, light, because these neurons have become sensitive to light through uh, particular interventions. And um, maybe the first question I would have for you, Ed, is you alluded to at the end uh, um, that you, uh, using these approaches in humans is, is one of the goals, obviously. But um, can you elaborate uh, on this? How, how far uh, are we, uh, or what will be the, the major hurdles, let's say, that have to be overcome to uh, use optogenetics, that's the name of the technology, in humans, for example, for um, treating uh, some even neuropsychiatric disorders? Mm -hmm. So there are a couple uh, major hurdles, um, some scientific and some clinical. Let's start with the clinical one, because it's a little bit simpler to explain. So uh, these molecules come from all sorts of organisms that either convert light into some form of energy or convert light uh, into some kind of signal. And I didn't go into much detail during the talk, but uh, some of these organisms are bacteria, some of them are algae, some of them are funguses. And so one question, of course, is you know, we're bringing in molecules from the wild into the body, and so how will the immune system or how will the body tolerate them? And so there's a, a number of, of of uh, efforts ongoing now to look, for example, in non-human primate models to see how these molecules are tolerated uh, and, to see, and to do histology and to understand immune reactions and so on. And so, so far it looks quite positive, but of course, you know, uh, it needs to be done at, at uh, um, uh, many groups are working to replicate, the, and, uh, replicate and extend these results. The second question is scientific. So in some regards, if you are going through all the trouble of a gene therapy to label a certain kind of cell, as opposed to an electrical stimulation, there needs to be some rationale, some reason for picking that cell. Um, and again, you know, in, in the human brain, we don't actually have a list of cell types uh, that's very detailed um, to the point where we know exactly what each cell is doing and what molecular handle we need to target gene expression to it. And so that might be one of the reasons why a lot of these groups that are exploring the translational path for optogenetics are picking the retina, are picking blindness, because in the eye, the list of cell types is much more concrete um, although not complete, one could argue, because people are finding new cell types all the time, um, but much more concrete than in the rest of the brain. So I think to understand the brain itself uh, and, and to map the brain is one of the things that can really help us to pick targets in the brain. You know, here's a cell type out of the perhaps thousands of cell types in a brain region that you would like to make sensitive to light. Well, <clears throat> then the second um, 
approach that uh, Grégoire um, presented to us is quite amazing uh, results that he has uh, obtained over the, the last two, three years, uh, relate to the idea of using the comp competences of the, uh, in the specific case of uh, spinal cord lesion, the competences of the remaining uh, spinal cord below the lesion, and uh, as you put it, put an accelerator and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the fuel and, and this uh, and that. And, uh, of course, it, it, it's, it's quite uh, impressive. Now, one of the <coughs> problems, in addition to locomotion, uh, that uh, patients have, uh, who have a spinal cord lesion have, is uh, also visceral functions and uh, all these non-voluntary movement, control of non-voluntary muscles. So how this approach, uh, now that you are moving into humans, and of course, uh, this will also be uh, one of the key uh, positive issues uh, if all this works in humans. How do you, are you approaching this, this aspect of m motor fu function? Well, it's a, thank you, Pierre. It's a very good question because it's true. This is the uh, apparent part of the iceberg. But, you know, when you have a spinal cord injury, there are many additional physiological functions that are affected. And locomotion for many spinal cord injured people is not the priority. Uh, of course, our approach has been entirely focused on restoring motor control capacities. What we did find, though, and it somehow resonates with what Professor Nicolelli showed, that when you reactivate the locomotor system, of course, you can also reactivate the autonomic system. And also, when you stimulate, we have activation of the bladder functions. And progressively, with this training, you have an improvement of the general physiology of the body. So less muscle atrophy, less osteoporosis. Uh, it seems that we can even reactivate some of the immune system. And we have some evidence that we prevent the development of bladder hyperreactivity. So, I mean, we are certainly not targeting this function, but in the clinical trial, we will evaluate through hemodynamic tests whether we can improve the recovery of the bladder control as well. Yeah, and that's, this brings me uh, this idea of how activity uh, can, by mobilizing uh, functions, you uh, improve uh, recovery, it brings me to to the third approach that we saw, that, that uh, Miguel presented about uh, brain-computer um, interface and how interpreting uh, um, cortical activity uh, through um, digital uh, uh, tr transduction uh, allows to uh, actually uh, be able to command uh, the, some of the uh, some functions. And this, the key point here is, and I think it's. Uh, certainly present in both uh, the approaches that you, uh, you, Miguel, and you, Gregoire, have is the notion of how the brain responds and adapts to these exogenous uh, in, and, in part, endogenous stimulations. In other words, the key is plasticity. You used the word uh, several times. And uh, so first, maybe a general question. How, how do you, of course, you are trying to leveraging on this capacity of the brain and I think it's a point maybe to, to highlight, because by, by mobilizing uh, certain functions, actually you um, have a larger impact and a, a remodeling, uh, due to the remodeling of some of the, um, the brain circuits. Yeah, exactly. I think this is the key component. It's the only reason brain-machine interfaces actually work. And in fact, uh, tomorrow there will be a paper, and uh, again, a University of Tokyo paper in current biology showing a rat that uh, receive a GPS device on the bone, and the electrical output that was coded of this GPS was delivered to the cortex, and in a week, the rat learns to navigate. You know, two years ago, we used an infrared sensor. We put in the frontal bone of rat, delivered to the S1 cortex, the somatosensory cortex, and in a few sessions, there was a representation of infrared world in the barrel cortex of these rats, and they were able to basically find beams of infrared light anywhere to drink water. And, and that's the reason we, we have a little divergence. The old guys like me and the new generation, I don't care which cell type, and the brain doesn't care either. So if you put these statistics into the brain, if you, the brain has access to new world statistics, it will find a way to remap it. It will optimize the statistics and get a representation of new reality there. And I think that's what uh, neuro rehab will be able to take advantage. You'll be able to create new realities, manipulating feedback, 
uh, to the brain, and in doing so, uh, se uh, change what is the definition of the body, what is the definition of the self, and I think we will see from now on a variety of, of applications. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe I can follow up on this. I remember a few years ago you told me, I think uh, in a maybe uh, in a way provocative, but you believed it, and I'm sure you still believe it, yeah. that essentially any cell, any neuron in the brain can be part of any uh, network. And this is very provocative because we are all used, and I'm sure many of you have seen these brain maps where there is localization of function and the neurons in the visual cortex are supposed to be um, so are activated uh, only by visual stimuli and, and so on. So a very kind of rigid mapping of the brain. But your work uh, and the work in this in this neurotechnology and, and brain stimulation and brain machine interface brings about the notion that maybe these territories, these functional territories, are not as rigidly mapped once and forever, but that you can mobilize different areas for different functions. Is, uh, you still believe yeah. this? In one of the experiments that Suleiman did uh, for his thesis here at the PFL with, in our lab at Duke, uh, he was able to make S1 neurons in the monkey cortex. In the sensory neurons. Yeah, neurons sensory neurons for touch. In the touch area, the cortex, start responding to vision yeah. continuously. So the monkeys, it's just by uh, altering the way the feedback was doing, was delivered to the monkeys, we found that 35% of S1 neurons can have both tactile and visual receptive fields in a matter of a few seconds. So, uh, so the brain needed more mass to compute this illusion that we are creating. So it had no problem in recruiting one third of the S1 cortex to actually become sort of visual cortex. Visual co yes. This is, is pre I mean, it's really a, a, a paradigm shift all for this. And maybe if I can uh, ask to the, the three of you a last question. I mean, in the title of the session, I mean, I know you didn't address it directly, but just have your, your feeling. Uh, the title of the session, there is the, the word, I think, uh, or the term, uh, enhancement or cognitive enhancement or something like this. So what, what is your take on, on, this, on this? Will we be able, this is just a provocative question, but maybe a little bit of science fiction, but will we be able to uh, one day introduce an extra memory uh, card in our uh, hippocampus uh, to uh, enhance memory? I mean, what, uh, do, you, do you think this is science fiction? Do you think there is something to that? Uh, nobody wants to answer. <laughs> well, <laughs> Let's go ahead. Let go ahead. <laughs> it's a tricky I feel question. I'm like excited by the question. Well, it's, it's a tricky question. That's the beauty of tenure. They cannot take it away, so I'll, exactly. I'll take it. Uh, in this experiment, for instance, that we will see tomorrow in this paper or in the experiment of in the infrared rat, uh, the animal got a new sensory modality. That animal, without any uh, uh, loss of the, as far as we can tell, he still could do tactile discrimination with the whiskers with no problem, but now he could do infrared discrimination. The same result uh, in this paper tomorrow will show that, and visual cortex and the G GPS discrimination. So in that sense, to some degree, there was an augmentation of function. Uh, Ted Berger has tried for many years to augment memories in the hippocampus, and to this day, I'm not sure it's convincing, not him and for him. Yeah. But, so there, there is a limit, I think, but that, that we can use plasticity to augment normal function, I, I think is conceivable without too much, uh, you know, exercise. Zegua, do you have a comment? Uh, well, you know, I, I grew up as a young scientist and I was fascinated by Miguel Nicolelli's work. And you know, when it enticed my imagination, how oh, you can control machine, robot, etc., with brain signals. And this is one of the reasons why I went in this field. And then I became confronted with patients with this technology and became more intimate with the potential and also the restriction. And I think the key for me has been to use all this public funding and you know, this amazing tool that the EPFL offers to me today to make sure that this technology is useful for human benefits. So for me, brain enhancement is not my priority. My priority uh, is to have a responsible message, not oversell. I know that we're going to, not going to cure spinal cord injury. I know that what we are doing is not going to help completely paralyze people to walk again. But our responsibility, I think, is to push this technology to this limit in order to improve recovery uh, in people who are in the need for it. And Ed, do you have a, an opinion on this question? 
provocative question? Well, two brief thoughts. So one thought is that, you know, a big, big theme that we've been talking about is how plasticity um, can, you know, and, and, you know, can be used to, re to constructively help improve functions. Um, and so I think what's happening, though, at a variety of parts of neuroscience is that people are learning sort of the principles of how the plasticity is induced, how certain molecules facilitate synaptic rearrangement, how certain signaling pathways can cause alteration of, of um, connections. And uh, with the optical neural stimulation, some groups actually are starting to try to perturb memories or alter memories and to study if they can be, you know, can a memory be transferred from one context to another and so on and so forth. So one possibility is that as you learn more and more about the mechanisms of, of memory and, and so forth, the, the, if rules emerge that cause you know, control knobs that, that are useful to, to take place, that could be very helpful for people with memory loss or dementia or other, other conditions. Thank you. Let's take, Bruno, let's I think see if there are some questions from the audience. Uh, really, if I may say, I was quite moved by the results that I saw today. Um, quick questions. Gregory, Grégoire, pardon. Um, Yes, it may be possible. Uh, what your work and Miguel's work, if you team up with Jeff Reisman of the University College of London, who took uh, olfactory sheath cells along with some nerves from the ankle and put them in a patient who had his spinal cord totally transected through a knife stabbing in the back, uh, that person is now walking with a walker. I see tremendous potential of putting your two technologies together. And yes, you will see that paralyzed people will be able to walk again and perhaps find the function. If I may ask, uh, Miguel, you said that the, there was essentially feeling at, at spots lower in the abdomen that you would have expected. Uh, any idea on the pathway? What has happened? What circuits were stimulated to allow that? Yeah, just in, the, in your comment, I'd like to emphasize that I think that there will be no single solution for paralysis. I think the combination of multiple techniques will be eventually used. You know, we have uh, in our exoskeleton a, a module that allows for uh, electrical stimulation of the spinal cord from outside. So since the corticospinal tract can uh, be plastic too, there is no uh, reason why not to combine techniques. That will happen naturally. In our case, uh, uh, of course, we don't, we don't know yet. We are looking for a, an explanation. But what I feel may have happened is that the complete uh, spinal cord evaluation diagnosis, as you know, is clinical. It's given by this Asia you know, test. I think that very likely, in most cases, there are some fibers that survive, you know, some descending fibers that are not completely lesion or were spared by the lesion, and they went quiet or they were not activated because the motor cortex was not driving them. Through this training, intensive training that we did, we may have reactivated uh, sectors of the motor cortex or even reactivated patterns that allow these fibers to be activated again. So because they were not destroyed originally. And that's the reason I think we, we are seeing uh, some uh, neurological functional recovery. What was stunning to us is that out of seven, you know, every one of them, uh, complete lesions, uh, every one of them had some improvement. So this must be a common phenomenon. Thank you. One last question for Ed. Uh, Sebastian Song, before he left MIT, you're saying you're mapping the, uh, the brain. He was mapping the brain also, but using electron microscopy slices. And he created a, a game called iWire that I believe was followed uh, in 150 different countries with uh, 120,000 people playing this game. Um, are you going to develop a game for mapping the brain using your approach, which I think is wet biology more than perhaps uh, <laughs> reflecting uh, something more natural? Um, we haven't thought about that yet. I mean, what we have been trying to think about is, you know, when, once you can see the molecular diversity that, uh, of synaptic connections, of cells, you know, do patterns emerge directly? Can we try to actually extract, you know, information and, uh, from the, the data itself? Um, and so, so one question that emerges, and maybe this is, you know, a, a longer conversation to have afterwards, is if you can stain with multiple colors, right, which we can do with light microscopy, which is, which is very difficult to do with electric microscopy, does it kind of allow you to do the data analysis in ways that can be automated and scaled up in interesting ways? Um, and so, uh, you know, having multiple colors is a very powerful strategy for error, error correction. But uh, it's a take, longer statistical discussion. You want to take all three questions, but 
Brief questions, please. Um, I have a brief question for Professor Courtin. Uh, you nicely showed the improvement of your rat after electrochemical stimulation and with the robots. But what happens after two months if you remove the robot? Are they able to uh, go against the gravity and walk alone? Or is the new robot needed for this walking? Mm -hmm. And what happens then in human? I mean, is the robot only or are the improvement only with the robots or is there also improvement in everyday life? So that's going to be the key challenge, I think. And it's a very good question. What do we observe? Of course, it all depends on the severity of the lesion. Right? There are various severity of lesion going from what is called complete, which is true what Miguel said, it's never complete. We know that there are almost all the time residual connections. If this animal has this kind of injury, very, very severe, they absolutely need the electrochemical stimulation to work and this robotic device to support their body weight. Now, if the lesion is less severe, meaning sparing 10% of the descending connection, people that would still be bound on a wheelchair, they can have some control. Then if we train the animal, but only early on, so freshly after the injury, then many of them would recover enough to be able to work just with electrical stimulation and even sometimes without any enabling uh, interventions. So it really depends on the severity of the lesion. And when it's very important to consider this aspect for the clinical trial, indeed, is that you have seen the patient walking in a robot, and I can tell you, each time we have a spinal cord injured person coming in the wheelchair, and you put them in a robot, and they start walking after half an hour, they have an enormous smile on their face, like a sense, like, I am walking again. And then five minutes after, they are back on the wheelchair, and then they are very disappointed. But they say, actually, I'm not walking, the robot helped me to walk. And the key for us is going to be to work on this transition from working in the sophisticated environment of the laboratory to an outcome that helped improve the quality of life when they're at home. It's going to take many years, I think, a lot of thinking. Sir? Hello. I'm Carlo Vittorio Canistraci from Technical University of Dresden. My question is more at the level of molecules and regeneration. Central nervous systems, uh, peripheral nervous systems can spontaneously regenerate as one cell are important, one cell are very important. Central nervous system cannot, and uh, uh, glial, scar glial scars are very an obstacle, a very important obstacle. My question is, do you know of a regenerative medicine approach based especially on glial cell that can play an important role for regenerating, for regenerating part and systems biology and regeneration of the spinal cord? Thank you for this. So, I mean, we are not naive. As I said, this is not a cure for spinal cord injury. And as Miguel emphasized, the key will be to combine all these interventions. Meaning, one, reactivate all the spared circuit below the injury and this residual pathway. Second, you need to create the permissive environment. If there is a lesion, you're going to create a cavity. So you can put maybe some glia, some stem cells, there are other approaches. There are many approaches that have been developed not to create a permissive environment. And on top of this, you will have to trigger, reactivate the intrinsic capacity of axon to grow and regenerate. And I think only when we will be able to coordinate in concert these different interventions, meaning permissive environment, regeneration, and the neuroprosthetic rehabilitation, you will be able to see an intervention that may improve the recovery with the more severe lesion of the spinal cord, and not before. And this is, of course, the approach we are following in my lab, but we should not underestimate the difficulties of all this combination. Because just with one little intervention to, to go to human, it's incredibly complicated. So imagine you know, combining all these very multifaceted approaches. But this is a challenge we are facing for the next many decades. Last question. Hi, I have a question regarding the brain um, machine interface. Thank you, first of all, for this amazing moment of bringing it um, also to the people outside of the science sphere. And that also is my question. Um, do you think how much is it possible to reduce this exoskeleton? Because um, it actually looks quite cruel and it doesn't look like something that is handy for the patient and, and could be implemented into the daily life of the patient. Oh, sure, yeah. Thank you. Well, the first cell phones were kind of crude, and they evolved pretty quickly. So it's a question of demand, and, and of course, uh, we already have a second prototype. I'm going to Brazil in two weeks, and we're going to have the first rounds of our patients walking autonomously 
uh, in different environments in, in a month. And so we already learned that we don't need all the degrees of freedom that we thought originally. We don't need the 15, 17 degrees of freedom. We can get away, according to the patients, with about 10. So we are reducing the weight. We want to reduce the weight. We want to improve the control, improve the sensation, and make something, because we have a big problem. We, when you walk autonomously, you need to provide balance. You need to provide stability. You know, there are about 30 gyroscopes in that machine trying to continuously keep this patient in balance. Um, so I think that as we move along, and now that we know that it can be done, and that's the reason it was so good to, to have the, the possibility of doing that in the World Cup, because it got you know, a lot of people in the world to see that science can also deliver good things. It was a non-profit consortium, no IP, no IPO, no nothing of that. It was just to show the whole planet that scientists can even deliver on time. You know, the Swiss were organizing the party, so we had to deliver this on 18 minutes, 33 seconds, and a few milliseconds, and we did. So I think that was good. Congratulations. Thank you. Too many young people here don't remember the first cell phones, which were actually a briefcase. Yeah. And uh, so, but we do remember. Thank you all for Thank you. your talks. Thank you.